Hey everybody, I'm here with Leather Apron Club from YouTube, known as Alex. I'm sure most of you guys are already familiar with his work. He's made uh, a few very high profile videos covering some controversial topics. That's not what we're going to talk about today though. I've seen some of uh, Alex's older videos and it reminds me of the kind of videos that I've made over the years uh, talking about philosophical concepts to the camera, the kind of stuff that you know a few dozen people want to listen to. Um, and I guess that was kind of the numbers that you were getting at first until you pumped out those you know, harder hitting yeah. videos, but um, I enjoyed the earlier stuff. So we're gonna kind of go back in time uh, to that phase in Alex's career. So how did you get interested in philosophy? You know, did you like have any formal education in it or what got it kicked off for you? Yeah, no, no formal education. Um, I, I can't even remember the specific time, but at some point I just picked up um, some of the ancients and I started reading the Greeks and um, yeah, I mean, just over time, I became really interested in Plato. Um, early on, I had a, a stint with the Stoics, kind of like the standard sort of progression that a lot of people go through. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the biggest single impact I, I can say that it's had on me is just giving me like a mode in which to think, a, a mode in which to like pursue truth and uh, really just, you know, sort of give me like the courage in a way to like get to the get to the truth, get to the absolute bottom of uh, whatever I'm trying to pursue in like a uh, a consistent and, and uh, methodical way. And yeah, I mean, I don't know, that's the main benefit I, I've sort of derived from it over the years. Um, I, I've since like, I guess, I guess expanded into reading like more, a little bit of more modern philosophy, but still like probably like the vast majority of what I read is still the ancients. And uh, I still like feel like a real deep connection to them and everything. Um, yeah, that's great. Leather Apron Club um, was the name of a discussion group, like a philosophical discussion group that Benjamin Franklin and some others had, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, for a couple of years, um, I had started with a friend and, and just a small group of friends that I have, like sort of a, a similar thing, like a, a philosophy night. We called it our symposium night, um, where we would all just prepare a philosophical discussion and give like a short talk and then have sort of a round table talk about it afterwards. And we called that sort of informally the leather apron club. So I started doing the videos just because I was like, Oh, it'd be cool to sort of, um, cause once we, once we talk about these things at our philosophy nights, they just kind of are lost. So it was a way at first for me to just say to the camera what I had said to all my friends. And then it was just a place that I could have a recording for it. Um, That's and yeah, cool. like no, nobody really watched those videos. I, 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 I liked, I liked doing them and I liked the content in them and everything, but you know, it's like YouTube is like an entertainment platform first and foremost. And it's like people want, they go there to be entertained. And then if along the way you get across a poignant political message or you educate them in some way, then, then so be it. But like they have to first either be entertained or, you know, trust you as a character or something like that. So um, it makes it tough for that, like sort of just really straightforward and almost dry philosophical content that I was doing and like you know the production qualities in there to, to grab people's people's attention and all that so yeah early on I was getting like no views but I wasn't really doing it for that um, sure. I still I guess aren't I'm, I'm not really doing it for the views <laughs> particularly but uh yeah yeah no that's admirable though um so I don't know if you can blame YouTube specifically I remember in book six of the Republic where Socrates kind of goes on on the hopelessness of the philosopher actually getting the chance to run the state, even though it would be best for everyone, just because of the nature of the mob and the kinds of points that come across as salient to people in these like time compressed formats that people uh, even used back then, like in court or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's just an eternal kind of struggle, uh, truth against lies. And that's good though. So what like what got you actually kicked off reading ancient philosophy and did you just try to like go straight into plato or like what did you get started with um yeah like i like i said i don't even totally remember i mean maybe i was just trying to seem like pretentious and i thought plato was like a good way to start with that or something i don't, I don't even remember i think it was like the end of high school or like the beginning of college or something like that that i really started to get into it 
Um, I, I, I really couldn't even tell you. I don't know. Read Plato for a while. Read a little bit of Aristotle and determined that I liked Plato a lot better. I read Camus and the Stoics because like that's something you do early on, I guess, mm. when you're really starting to get into philosophy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I suppose like, the only influence could really be my family is sort of um, like we always had sort of like argumentative uh, traditions. I don't know around the around the dinner table, just like good natured discussion back and forth so I, I don't know if that's what got me into it or what but yeah i have a similar kind of story like my dad loved to argue would argue about anything my grandmother loved to argue even more like we would have this ongoing debate as to whether california was a de a desert ecosystem or a mediterranean ecosystem the kind of stuff like nowadays you would just look it up and get your answer but back in the day like people would argue about all sorts of things um I wish that was more a part of the culture because today, like the kinds of arguments you have online, um, I don't know. I think people used to have more like good faith, you know, investment in just the conversational aspect of it. Whereas now, like the the way that people are treating each other in online uh, debates just doesn't make uh, progress possible um, in many cases. So you liked arguing as a kid. Did you have an interest in like big philosophical questions as a small child, like the nature of the universe, God, and things like that? Oh man, um, I hardly. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, what, what, I don't even know what I was interested in as a kid. It's just video games, normal kid stuff. Um, I don't. I, I've been doing more thinking about God and just theology generally recently more than anything um you know i'm still sort of undecided on the whole religion question uh you know religion and philo er, religion and theology i guess almost like being considered as like two separate questions for me because um i don't know I, I i'm still like unfortunately just I, I couldn't even label myself any one particular thing like um i know i'm not a christian i i, I feel somewhat strongly about that um but at the same time like i recognize the existence of a god um maybe i don't know the closest thing you can label me is some sort of deist um but i you know even that like i don't know, i i feel like just in the past like few years like anytime i feel like i get a start to get a solid grasp on where i lie like in regards to theology like something will will come up i'll have a different experience and then you know I just feel like totally kind of lost again. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like, what do you feel? How are you a Christian? Are you religious at I all? I am or? a Christian. Um, I have very good arguments, though, for why, for why um, in my opinion. But uh, it's not like what I've placed first. Uh, so I was a Christian on and off growing up. And then uh, eventually I got into like Joseph Campbell and comparative mythology and like the perennial philosophy idea. I read Aldous Huxley's book, The Perennial Philosophy, and also uh, the Upanishads. And then I started going to like a Hindu temple and discussing philosophy with the monks. And that was uh, a big kind of game changer for me. Uh, before that though, and really like the motivation to get into philosophy for me was those big like cosmological physics questions. I was reading like popular physics books in high school and I was interested in questions in philosophy of physics. Um, and then I found that there was this convergence with the comparative mythology and like Eastern religion sphere, and then concepts in very contemporary uh, physics, like the many worlds interpretation, the idea of like many different cosmic cycles and things like that is there in Hinduism. Um, other notions like the kind of holographic principle um, in physics, the idea that like the part contains the whole in some sort, in some sense, like Leibniz believed that as well, but I saw that in Hinduism and was making connections and, uh, and then kind of just developed my philosophy um, from there um, in my own vein. Are you familiar with the idea of the perennial philosophy or like uppercase T traditionalism, Ganon, um, Evola, these sorts of people? Okay. Uh, I have read a bit of Evola, but no, I've never heard of that. Yeah, like, Evola is sort of the idea. odd man out uh, among the traditionalist authors, Kuraswami, Ganon, Shuan, Eliada, 
are more uh, like mainline monist types. Uh, I don't want to absolutize that, but like uh, Evola is more dualistic. And he also emphasizes the role of the warrior caste, which I think is in contrast to everything that derives from Hinduism, where there are the three castes based on the sattva nature, rajas nature, and tamas nature. So it's like the intellectual energy, the warrior spirited energy, and then the appetitive energy, which obviously sounds like the tripartite soul from Plato, from the Republic. Mm -hmm. Um, and most of the traditionalists elevate that sattvic type and say the priestly ascetic should be the one ruling. Plato sort of seems to lean that way, although he also introduces like a warrior element into the guardian society. But uh, Ebola is like not totally representative for a good like introductory book on the perennial philosophy, even though Huxley is like a dubious figure in, in some ways and has like suspicious associations with secret societies in England. Um, it's still a very good book, The Perennial Philosophy, just to kind of outline, outline those basic doctrines. Um, were you ever interested in, in physics or like cosmological questions? Uh, I, I suppose I had sort of like a passing interest. I don't know. I watched, I don't know, like the universe and all those documentaries and stuff when they came out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I guess not in particular. I don't know. I don't know, philosophy for me, like, you definitely gotten way deeper into it than, than I ever did um, in terms of, like, uh, what you're talking about here. But um, I don't know, I guess, the, like, like like I said before, like, the main benefit I derived was just, like, giving me a, a, a way of, a, of thinking, a way of, like, approaching, thing, but, uh, approaching things. But I don't know that I've ever been able to, like, derive from anything I've read a particular cosmological out, uh, outlook on life or a religious right. outlook on life or something like that. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the way you, that you've approached it, though, has really paid off for you in that it's clarified your thinking. I bet it even helps in your, like, professional life, I would imagine, just that clear, like, distinction of categories and, like, uh, despite what people might think, being professionally trained in philosophy does tend to pay off. Like, it's not one of the lower um, earning majors that you could pick. A lot of corporations hmm. like understand that people who have philosophical training do know how to think. You know that's kind of the main advantage of it. Um, and yeah, your early videos definitely I can see that like uh, that philosophical inclination for you is really um, like parsing things, analyzing things, and looking at the structure of arguments. And that's really valuable in itself. Um, but it sounds like right, it has. Yeah. yeah. Go on. No, I just like, yeah, even the way like you'll read a platonic dialogue and just the way he actually like approaches things. Like I, I try to do, I guess, just sort of emulate that in a way like, you know, uh, I have a video about like questioning if the Civil War was about slavery or not. And obviously that's a loaded question, but like, like, it, I mean, to even start approaching that, like you have to define in so many different ways, like what, what does it even mean for the war to be about something um, you know, if we, in, if we analyze like the individual motivations of like all the people that were fighting the war at all these different like stratas of, of stratums of society, we'll come to almost like a different answer for every single, uh, every single, like every single class, every single person even. Um, so yeah, I, I guess in that way, that was like, that's like straight out of, uh, the stuff, the stuff I've read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Plato definitely will train you to think, not necessarily strictly analytically even, like it helps you to analyze specific concepts, but the kinds of questions, like reorienting questions that break frame, that like get you to question presuppositions that Socrates asks, and just the way that he kind of drills down. And you learn a lot of like legitimate um, reasoning tactics, like, you know, reductio ad absurdum arguments or a fortiori arguments. You can see modus ponens, mod modus tollens, all of the basic structures that you have to get used to using, but they're not labeled. It's not like the autistic, Aristotelian, syllogistic, where you have to mm -hmm. memorize all these names. Like Plato very naturally integrates these principles of reasoning into like a beautiful work of, of literature. So like, yeah, I, I always, I don't know, maybe that's the reason I always had a hard time reading 
Aristotle. Like, I, I, I've gotten through a couple of his books, but like, you know, even reading like, uh, the, the poetics or whatever, you know, he's talking about poetry and like, yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of what you're saying. Like, it's too autistic. It's too broken up into all these all these terms. And he's, I don't know. Right. I, I heard that that was like sort of a concept among philosophers. I remember someone saying that like, you know, every man is either like prefers Aristotle or prefers Plato or something like that. So maybe that's why. Yeah. No, I think it, it does kind of pan out that way. Also, because that's the first major division that persisted in at least like the written Western philosophical tradition. Like, yeah, the Stoics branch off as well, but they're ultimately taking elements from either Plato or Aristotle themselves. And just because like, this is this corpus of work that we have had all along, like we've always had the Aristotelian corpus and the Platonic corpus. And look like, look at these bodies of work compared with what survives from the Stoics. Like, what do we have from them? We have Epictetus, we have Marcus Aurelius, a handful of things, but like it's just not a systematic whole like either Plato or Aristotle was. So yeah. Western philosophy had no choice but to like develop on these two already established tracks. Yeah, and that I actually have a question about the Stoics. Like every time I've read them, I've read um, uh, Epictetus. Uh, I think Lucretius is considered a Stoic. Um, I've read mm -hmm. on the nature of things. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I read Meditations because that, that's like what everyone tends to start with because it's super short and uh, Silicon Valley bros like to read it for, for that reason but uh, I don't know I feel like I never actually got very much useful out of the Stoics besides well a lot of strange cos cosmology that seemed to be actually like the bulk of what their writings was, was about and then I don't know maybe, maybe I've just been consuming too much of like the the modernized distilled down version of it but like i feel like i don't get anything out of it besides just like don't worry about it bro you know <laughs> right it is a lot of that i found that, that the meditations actually did contain like a lot of useful practical insights but as far as like a philosophical system i really don't think it has all that much to offer ultimately it is a kind of materialism where like the finest form of matter is also the principle of, of reason. So the ancients in general like held that the four elements moved uh, in an ascending rank of like worth or value from the grossest earth through water, through air, through fire being like the most rarefied and most noble of the elements. So fire is this kind of principle of uh, logos for the Stoics. Somehow they like equivocated between the principle of reason and that like archetype of, of matter or something. Um, they had a lot of concepts that were actually brought into Neoplatonism, like the idea that human beings have the kind of structure and principles of nature imprinted in our psyche. They called it the koinai anoiai, innate ideas basically are common ideas. Um, so some stoic concepts did, I think, serve a purpose later on. Um, but I don't really get the overall picture and I don't know that there's enough of the source documents uh, that survived to really get the overall picture, what they were right. talking about. I think they were influenced by Heraclitus quite a bit at a certain level. Um, but yeah, I yeah, wouldn't I mean, go down that, that route. Yeah, it seemed like if anything, that was sort of like the popular animating philosophy that was being taught in Rome during like long stretches of time. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, t I think I just draw a parallel between Silicon Valley bros who have adopted it in the modern day and them. And it's like, was it really, I don't know, maybe it's sacrilegious to say, but was it really that much deeper back then? Or, you know. Yeah, I don't like, know. <laughs> I know they did work in logic. I mean, they definitely improved on Aristotle's logic. Like Aristotle didn't recognize formally uh, modus tollens, although he uses it. But... Uh, the Stoics like classified that and some other other issues that Aristotle didn't address. Um, so it's all good. I mean, I like reading the ancients just in general because they have this like expansive, clear, like taking their time, exploring ideas, not committing to one immediately. In the same way that like when you read the founding fathers, they have they take a lot of time you know, exploring the ideas they're discussing and they don't seem like 
so utterly committed to what they're saying as someone like Sam Harris. When Sam Harris like proclaims one of his doctrines, it sounds like he could not be persuaded out of his position. Um, right. The ancients seem a lot more like level-headed in general. One of the first mm -hmm. ancient texts I read was actually Julius Caesar's Conquest of Gaul. And even though it's just describing battles, like the, I just had never really experienced that level of clarity of thought. And I don't think it's yeah. something that modern people could even recover, like in our yeah, setting. I, it seems like they mostly just had the benefit of knowing they were writing to only the patrician class. And like, you know, Sam Harris has to, he has to address the plebs. That's, he has to address us, I guess. So, yeah, that's a good point. Like, you know, uh, democratization you know, I, yeah like least yeah like are there any or... i'm trying to think of are there, are there any like well-known examples of because like even if we get a speech from someone from ancient rome that they supposedly gave to the the plebs it's like you know how much has that been the guy could have wrote it six months after he supposedly gave the speech and like i'm, I'm sure he prettied it up because when it's now being written but i well, but even that it's like we know I've i've been looking a lot into um research for my next video which is on like uh the roman homosexuality thing i kind of want to continue the ancient homosexuality sort of like mini series sort of thing but you know even that like <laughs> some of the stuff they wrote is is really racy so like i, I think that's really just the distinction is like, they, they were just talking to the plebs like you know it was so common that people would like make accusations of like uh you know i buggered your son or whatever as like a you know, in, in a court or whatever. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, I won't get into that case, but that, that, that was like actually from a, a court case that I read. This guy was like, he was defending himself against being like a, a soft man. And he said as testimony against that, that he buggered the, uh, the guy who was accusing him, his son. And, but yeah, I mean, so I guess that was kind of the level of stuff that was, given out to the masses as opposed to yeah julius caesar was not writing for your average guy you know he was writing for the the elite class so yeah i don't know i guess i guess we have the benefit of having those those works that uh they intended for the audience they, they basically respected the audience's intelligence which is what we like today yeah i guess the equivalent would be like scientific journals like there are a class of people who read white papers and scientific articles and then there's like people who watch youtube videos and uh read popular books yeah um, that that's actually it'd be cool to get your thought on this um what is like the appropriate level of uh, i don't know academic like rigor or um you know even like the level of vocabulary we use, like what is the, what is the appropriate level to put in a YouTube video? Because again, my thought on it is like people approach YouTube, they go to YouTube to be entertained first and foremost. And then as an accident, they could, you know, develop a relationship with a creator, build trust with him or um, learn something. But like, uh, th it seems like there's a really fine line. Like, like if I, if I had my way, like I would, um, I'd probably put out videos that are like, you know, two, three hours long, which I know some people do on YouTube, but I feel like that's not like the right, really the right way to go. Um, and I would, I would like for a lot of them, like I, like I put out, you know, I cut out a lot of stuff from the videos I'm doing. Um, uh, sometimes like I'll drop citations just because like, I feel like it's something that'll ultimately just, uh, it'll cut out, it'll mess up the flow of the video and then people won't watch it. And like, ultimately I'm just trying to get the information out to them. But like, there has to be a best way to do it because, you know, if I just go back to uh, just reading, I guess, either, either reading a script or doing an unscripted video in the woods somewhere, you know, no one's really going to watch watch it. And it's like, I don't know. Do you, do you have any particular thoughts on that? Like, I, I'm always trying to strike a balance there. Right. I'm probably not the best person to ask because I really have not shot for uh, success so far with what I've done. Um but even for going out into the woods, I think there is a limitation of the medium where you can only expect your listeners to have a certain attention span. So ideas have to come rapidly. They have to be sufficiently novel and deep to like keep their interest. 
And even going a little bit beyond what a person would reasonably be able to fact check, like in real time, I think is fair game because it's sort of part of the medium. It, it's to be expected at a certain level. Like, um, I don't know. I, I like the way that Sean Last or Ryan Falk have presented information in like race realism and stuff like that. Sean Last really just like fires things out, very common sense, like laying everything out, charts on the table. That's one style, I think, where it's just exactly what you would need if you were a rational actor to like make a clear evaluation on the subject. Talking in the woods and that like, that's what I've tried to do more because a lot of my ideas are not like obviously scientifically decidable here and now with current evidence. So I like pushing it up to like maintain a coherent stream of thought that people can cling on to and then push a little bit beyond that just to like open up that space of questioning, hint at some ideas, you know, to just kind of, cause it, it is an instrument for stimulating thought. Like that's why people, I think, watch videos like that to get new ideas, but not just to like download new ideas, but to like stimulate new avenues of uh, philosophical discourse. Um, right. But as far as the kind of thing that you've done, like that's more what, you know, Ryan Falk has done hour long, two hour long videos exploring certain top topics that absolutely persuaded me back in the day, like back in 2012, 2013, a lot of me coming into my current views was watching like Ryan Falk's long breakdowns of certain, you know, scientific concepts. So there is a place for that. There is an audience for that, particularly in our, in our circles, especially if it's something that people haven't heard before. So it's really like you can go as far as you want. I think pe somebody's going to listen to you. But also, I like right. the kind of balance that you've struck, and I think that's you know something to be said for that. Yeah, it it just seems like, and it's not at all to like, oh, I'm trying to get views or be popular or anything. It, it, but it seems like there's a way to like min max how effective your messaging is, is, and like how ultimately like how much you can influence the world to be more like you want it to be. Um, I don't know. So I guess I guess I'm always thinking about that, but you know, it's hard to know when you hit it just right. Because like, you'll never know if you were, uh, maybe it was too long or too boring or whatever. But uh, I don't know. Always lots to think of, think about there. Yeah, I mean the kinds of topics that you've been exploring, I think, are novel enough and like you're an original thinker enough that people are willing to spend the time watching your videos. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're tracking like your metrics as far as like how long people stay tuned in for. Um, yeah, I've looked at them. I don't know. I should probably be tracking it closer. But... It's always relatively depressing just because people do have a short attention span. So like you see that uh, from my channel, you know, a video got, you know, 3000 views. That's great. Um, but then you go and like, okay, so people listen to like the first five minutes and then 50% of them dropped out. It's not always yeah. that bad, but yeah, it is. Uh, people have very short attention spans and just anything that you do online people will flake out. It doesn't matter how committed or excited they seem at first. Ultimately, it is just kind of a numbers game, the nature of the medium. Like you have to just be reaching out to new people and trying new things. And um, ultimately there's very little to lose, you know, unless you're like saying politically incorrect things and you have a job to lose or something like that, then yeah, it can work out badly for you. But uh, in general, I just like the medium for like the creative freedom uh, that it still allows for despite constraints uh, mm -hmm. on the subject of like changing the world in the direction that you would like um, I've seen some of your older videos where you talked about your own political concepts um, but what about like your kind of strictly speaking ethical views you know what are kind of your ethical foundations and how do you think you you know ground them yeah um, man yeah it's a deep one uh, yeah, I mean, ethically speaking, um, I don't know, is it even, is it fair to say my ethics are motivated by, like, by politics? I, I don't know, like, I, I guess, I guess, very generally speaking, I, I feel like I identify with, like, the, the concept of, like, a universal goodness or a universal God, whatever you want to call it, some sort of 
like abstract force, I guess you could even call it, if you don't want to call it like, you know, personify or whatever, that that basically just means that there is an absolute objective good in the world. Um, that something that if we if we live in accordance with um, our lives will necessarily be better because it, it's a hard rule. It's a mathematical rule that's unavoidable. Um, I mean, from that, I, I could derive a whole bunch of specifics, I suppose. Um, uh, I mean, the most important thing, and I guess what I'm pushing on my platform, not strictly ethically related, but um, it's, in, it's, it's basically just it's sort of nationalistic ideas. Um, I think, you know, you can tie obviously into that. Uh, probably won't be anything... Uh, that people haven't heard before but you can obviously say like uh, there are the ethics of like the right of a of a people to exist and um, the right to life liberty property and all those things um, that are obviously being just implicitly sort of questioned with all that's going on in the world um, I don't know if that particularly makes sense driving ethics from like a political worldview but I get uh, that's the instinct I mean people definitely do it yeah I see. Right. That's probably the norm, in fact. Like, yeah. We're a very political, uh, politically charged um, public, historically speaking. I think only like Anglo populations through history have been as politically active. Well, I guess the French, like French intellectuals, were pretty active mm. themselves back in the day. But like, it's historically very abnormal. I think we politicize like everything, and we can't detach any news story from pol- like everything centers around politics. Right. Yeah, I mean, not to say. Yeah, I don't know. It certainly seems to be the case with like abortion and everything, um, but I, I don't know. Like something like that, I would hope that that's firstly an ethical concern, and then down the road a political concern. But um, I don't think it, it is. Seems... I, like for people, no. I think it's really primarily political. Even religion, it's like people treat religion politically like an affiliation with the catholic church how much is that truly motivated by ethical sentiments and how much is that uh animated by in-group loyalty i would say if you could like get in there with a ct scan you would see those areas of the brain flare up more so yeah i I think that's probably fair to say for some of the christians i know yeah that's kind of um I guess that should be expected. I mean, how many people can you really be expected to be like purely motivated by some abstract ethics rather than like concrete existence, you know? Yeah. Right. Very few. Um, so there was a step in there going from like, there is the objective good to there are these certain objective kind of rights that we have, or there are certain, norms that humans should live by um have you like do you think you could fill that out a little bit more between like what is the nature of that universal good and then why does that ultimately justify something like you know the right of self-determination of a people yeah oh man let me see if i can come up with a convincing sounding answer for that um i don't know Let's see. If there is... I don't know. If there is a universal good that we have to live in... That we ought to live in accordance with in order to maximize human flourishing and satisfaction, happiness, whatever you want to call it, then... I don't know. I suppose it just seems self-evident that, like, we ought to be able to procure the means necessary. This is talking about it from the political sense, but procure the means necessary in order to to live out that live most in accordance with that goodness like as you can't really fairly like you you can't be someone who i think lives perfectly in accordance with goodness without like having some means some some way by which to sustain you and your your way of life your family and all these things like you you know you can be the uh the diogenes like in in theory however when it really comes down to it, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna get anywhere. You're not gonna uh, promote a sustainable community, which actually pursues exists to pursue this good. If you're just, you know, shitting in the streets and drinking 
drinking water just from the stream or whatever, never having any kids. Um, so, I mean, something like that could justify it. You obviously need material means in order to create a sustainable community that, that pursues the good. Right. Yeah, no, that's good. I was thinking about that today, like justifications for the rights of peoples to self-determine, not necessarily in terms of like that justifies the nation state as a form of governance, but just like the kind of lesser, more uh, social nationalism, like the original herder sense of nationalism, um, justifying that from like freedom at some level. Like you can't be free to pursue life, liberty, happiness, unless you have a broader network around you. And if like the state is coercively telling you how you're supposed to associate and the, right. you know, the type of culture that you're allowed to, to form, like, how free are you? You could be free as an individual, but part of how we define as individuals is off of the collectives that we're a part of. So like you can yeah, strain yeah. that collective freedom. Of course you're constraining individual freedom. So it sounds like we sort of just derived the, uh, hierarchy of needs sort of idea. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the way you went about it also kind of reminded me of like, uh, Jefferson, or or Benjamin Franklin like there's that sort of rationale as well and they are you know they were deists for the most part or at least those two were um how like how many of the founding fathers have you read extensively you're obviously influenced by them so yeah um I've I've read a little bit I think I've pretty much with Benjamin Franklin I've read his autobiography which is where I learned about the leather apron club I read a bit of um, Jefferson a bit more extensively, uh, Federalist Papers, and um, maybe a few other things, kind of, kind of around that. Mm -hmm. It's probably mostly what I've read. Um, yeah, Franklin's autobiography is very good. Um, I forget if it's there where he outlines his like system for. It, it reads very much like one of these modern business mindset self help type books, like the processes right. he would go through his kind of checklists for like, um, you know, improving his habits day to day. Um, really interesting thinkers, all of them. Um, have you looked into like the Masonic connection <laughs> with the founding fathers? And that I sort heard of thing? one thing. I, I mean, not very deeply. I mean, I know they were all Masons. Um, I heard that one thing. I don't know if you've heard about this. Some apparently Jefferson wrote a letter. I, or, uh, sorry, Washington wrote a letter. I think it, it might have been to Franklin or it was to one of them um, talking about like the concern he had for the these Masonic lodges being influenced or something, mm -hmm. uh, being infiltrated by uh, a as they had been in Europe, which I think means by like by Jewish people is what was happening at the time in Europe. Well, that's what has uh, happened, in fact. But yeah. Right, right. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that letter, but I remember reading that like years ago at this point. I thought it was very interesting what he was talking about. Um, Cause I mean, by all accounts, it seems that the Masons were uh, a really honorable institution for the longest time, but yeah, uh, it's a very mixed history. It's hard to know what to think about the Masons, you know, like right. as, as a perennialist at a certain level, they're very close to my worldview and they, they like Pythagoras. I'm a big Pythagoras fan like they're into the many of them are into like sacred geometry and the whole um you know demiurge narrative they view the demiurge very much like plato viewed the demiurge they're very platonic in their their own kind of worldview at a certain level and yet it does seem like it's with a twist with a luciferian kind of humanist twist right um which some people try to read into Plato, I'd be less inclined to do that. Like Jason uh, Giorgiani kind of wants to read that into Plato. And like all Greeks are Promethean to a certain extent, just like all like Western people are Faustian to a certain extent. So there is that at, at some level, but yeah, masonry, just uh, the way that it ended up developing, definitely I'm very like questioning of the organization. Right. Um, was, wasn't there some connection early on? I don't know if this is kind of hearsay, but weren't they, some people think they were founded by the Knights Templar or yeah. something. And yeah. The Templars that were, that just... that's my understanding. Um, 
they were banned from France and, and various places. And then I think the first like Scottish lodges, uh, people have traced to these like Templars in exile settling back. Some people say they actually went to the new world first for a time. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff, uh, along those lines. Hard to know what is true about it. Um, but philosophically speaking, like I have this weird, like love, hate, you know, dynamic psychologically with the Masons. My grandfather was a, a high level Mason, but I also like, didn't speak with him. He died when mm -hmm. I was young. So, um, but then that was my, the grandmother that loved arguing, like she was it's that, uh, that side of the family and <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's just interesting. Um, what yeah, about like other, they're... sorry, what about other like secret society type stuff? I, I feel like the sort of videos that you've done are very much like exposing kind of the false narratives that have been put out there which is, it's not quite conspiracy theory, like what you're doing, but it's sort of a similar genre of YouTube video. And I feel like you can easily transition into more of the explicit conspiracy theory side of things. Uh, yeah, do you mean in like a negative context? No, like no, 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 I like, I'm a conspiracy theorist. theorist. I'm very pro okay, okay. theorizing in general. Yeah, it, I mean, it, going a little bit deeper, it, anytime you go a little bit deeper, it just becomes difficult because the amount of concrete information that you can actually point people to is just, you know, it becomes harder and harder to get, get to. Um, I mean, what I prefer to do and kind of the topics I've done and I'm considering doing in the future, um, they pertain to, pertain to things that are just, um, misunderstood because people have been, been presented with a very simplified version of the narrative. Um, you know, uh, the gay Greeks thing. Well, it's, it's easy to, put that idea out to the masses because one it's kind of funny to poke fun at greeks and two the average person doesn't really know anything about ancient greeks so you tell someone two three things about it that suddenly is the sum total of their knowledge on the subject and then you know if every single piece of information you have in your head points to one thing you're obviously going to think that way about it so you know that, that was just a matter of like i can pull up all the sources people where people were talking about um how pederasty and sexual pederasty is problematic you know th that's a lot more straightforward than like i well i don't know exactly what you had in mind but you know are we talking like jfk was assassinated then we're we're talking about potential meetings in smoke-filled rooms in the 60s and like uh de well, depends exactly is, where you want to go on it. a lot of stuff is pretty like well documented like you know i know you're interested in the the banking system to some extent and people have covered that, you know, ad nauseum on YouTube, mm -hmm. like uh, 1913 Federal Reserve Act, um, right. Jekyll Island, this sort of thing. Um, but there's just a lot of history along those lines that marginal figures have covered, but are just not well known because it hasn't like that hit video has not been made on the subject. Like um, I saw something on the. I think it's like 1891. I could be get, getting the date wrong here, but the Council on World Religions um, in Chicago, where like uh, Swami Vivekananda, who is Ramakrishna's, one of his disciples went and was like a keynote speaker. And then like, I think Helena Blavatsky was there and the early uh, theosophists. And it seems like a real like moment where a new like, formula or plan for like Western spirituality was kind of launched and where I studied uh, with the, the Hindus um, was at the Vedana Center in Hollywood. So that's in fact where they had planned uh, and this was a slightly different organization. I'm get, just getting the details straight in my mind. So the, uh, the, the Theosophical Society in Hollywood obviously like they would talk with the Vedanta society. Like I said, they, they were kind of at the same conference. They knew each other. Their, their philosophies are very similar. Like they talk about similar concepts like the yugas. And, uh, I don't think Hindus talk about root races too much, but there's a lot of cross pollination, but the theosophical society in Hollywood believed that like a new 
messiah teacher great teacher would come they like identified the buddhist figure of maitreya with the hindu figure of kalki with the second coming of christ with the end times prophets in in uh islam and so they were really actually expecting someone to show up and they built a compound in the hollywood hills and like planned that this would that's why this was like the place to do it because it's the the media capital of this new like media age and they thought like this would be the perfect place for this new world teacher to kind of broadcast his message to the masses and obviously that didn't work out eventually they sold uh that development and it's housing now so i walked through like that area where it was supposed to be um but ultimately they ended up finding ramakrishna uh sorry not ramakrishna krishnamurti um, who's famous from lectures he used to give like back in the 80s. He was like a popular spiritual leader. Um, Krishnamurti eventually turned on the Theosophical Society, though, and found it creepy that they you know, had all these expectations and hopes for him. So that's just kind of the surface level stuff that I have become aware of. But I do see like there's some kind of much deeper spiritual agenda involving Theosophy, involving the Masons, involving i know like the un um has funded some like spiritual organizations a lot of spiritual organizations have uh, like branched off from the masons and I, I don't know if it's all one big organized conspiracy it's just like some of these trains of thought including also stuff that was going on in nazi germany with like the Vril society and um that's a the kind of like interesting historical meta conspiracy that like is relevant today at some level where i just don't have really the patience to like look up a lot of specific historical details and then present like a well-formed narrative of like this is the hidden hand at work here right i mean there are other like historical narratives but that's the kind of like conspiracy that i'm talking about stuff where there is a lot of information it's just not well known by people right yeah i i mean something like that like you've been talking about i would be concerned of like i mean you just have to have your your facts first of all like incredibly straight uh, for all that stuff but also like you have to know exactly what you what it is you're trying to tell people like the message you're trying to get across mm -hmm. uh you know it you're walking such a fine line between like coming across as rational and just this is something that's interesting and maybe connected um mm -hmm. to certain going going ons these days and you know just coming across as like a crackpot like, you know, I, as well presented as it could be and as, as legitimate as the information could be, you know, I would be scared to like, you know, if I put out a video like that, um, I think people will look at it and just be like, oh, you know, he's talking about some strange um, religious cult that was going on in the, late, in the late 1800s and attempts to make a tenuous Mason connection or something. And I don't know. It's, I'm not saying that it's like something that, shouldn't be done or it's, it doesn't have value but you know some i guess like the, just the difficulty of putting out information like that um in a way still that's like something that someone will want to watch and uh you know walking that fine line of like what is actually good messaging like it, it just becomes way way tougher with something like that where uh, i don't know i, I would just be hesit <laughs> hesitant to like approach something like that Right. Well, as someone who's made like several videos on Atlantis, I'm not worried about being considered a crackpot right. at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, you... yeah, it, it's not even crazy. Like, it's not even like <laughs> I, I see the arguments for Atlantis and like all, all the evidence. And like, frankly, you know, if I had to put money on it, I'd say, yeah, probably something like that did exist. I don't think we know much about it. But, you know, at the same time, like, I, I guess with the, the kind of stuff I'm trying to put out, like, I just want it like not to the point that like you can't argue it but to the point that like just what I'm trying to say um, although it may be measured although I may say like this isn't 100% a fact I just like I don't know I want it to come across as like very level headed very down to earth um, well researched kind of airtight cases right? yeah pretty much because you know ultimately I'm just going to end up doing a lot more harm to these subjects that um, you know, if there is what I perceive to be a societal misunderstanding or like a demonization, like in the case mm -hmm. of Jefferson, if I put out a low quality video uh, on something like that, or even if uh, 
something I've put out in the past uh, paints me in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, like that's that's all something like I, I feel like you have to be, you have to be careful about, you have to be hesitant about. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I guess also like I, I'm motivated um, politically in a lot of ways. Like I want, I want something that I'm going to put out to be like something that is actually politically viable today like something that'll move the needle again like kind of in the direction that i would prefer things go um so in particular yeah so that in particular that example you gave um like that i guess that's something i'd be more hesitant to do you know well sure yeah um people are like people want to know about the the pedophile elites you know they want to know about these secret cabals you know with their own special religious ceremonies and mm -hmm. you know uh, jay dyer talks about that kind of aspect of things um analyzes it in hollywood i think pretty well um but there are other topics that you know <laughs> not to just like pitch you video ideas that, that i want to see you make but like uh J the jews in rome like around the uh transition from the republic to the empire Jews were massively influential, you know, I think Domitian, um, like most of his, not his cabinet, but like his court or, or whatnot was Jewish. Like the finance people were Jewish. Uh, Josephus was the court, uh, historian for Domitian. Yep. Um, so they were clearly like s super influential. I think they were like yeah. up to half of the population of Alexandria, which was one of the biggest cities in the empire. So that's something where, yeah, people don't necessarily know, like, the truth about, you know, the destruction of the se the uh, Second Temple or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, what, what was really going on in the background? That'd be an interesting one. Uh, yeah, that'd be super interesting. I mean, they were probably just overrepresented in Domitian's, you know, upper council because they were smarter than everyone else. But, you know. Uh, uh. Possibly. But wait, didn't you make a video saying they were average IQ? Yeah, I I don't know. I think that's just a silly a silly argument to attempt to explain all of their overrepresentation by by that metric alone. No. Also, the, funny like the um the high IQ argument that they've like developed or like the genetic argument for it says that it was um, mostly persecution in in Europe. That that's how I, I saw it presented. Mm -hmm. That like influenced their genes, uh, like the various various times they were either. Uh, Persecuted, killed, or, or what have you. Like, oh, only the smart ones survived is, like, the super boiled down version of it. So, yeah, I, I mean, and I don't know. But they'd probably stick to that one even with a Roman example because they're like, oh, well, we were, you know. When, like, I mean, when were they initially kicked out of, kicked out of Israel? Like, I don't even know the year. But long before Ro Roman times even, so. They'd probably still cling mm -hmm. to that idea even then. Who knows? But I mean, that's right. interesting. That, that that's something that would be cool. Um, I've read a little bit about uh, ancient Jewish history, or I guess Roman Jewish relations, just in um, uh, what's that book, The Jewish Wars, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's that, Yeah, that's not even something I knew. I knew a ton about, or maybe I just forgot that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to like walk the line between. Robert Seffer videos and then like the kind of exposing like untrue mainstream narrative videos because they're on a similar kind of it's just how far do you want to go like how occult do you want to initiate right. people into yeah I, I'm hesitant to walk you know walk into that area like like again like when I put out you know those videos talking about Jewish representation um, like that's almost you can't do that with everything because in that case, I'm just presenting a spreadsheet. I'm just presenting a number. So that's, that's truly irrefutable. You can him and haw as to what the reason is, but you, you can't deny the existence of those numbers. And that's, you know, I don't even talk about what I think is going on in those videos. Um, but I, I, I always just want to tend more towards that side. Like I, right. I want to put it out as a conversation piece as like, a, like, Oh yeah. Well, if 42%, of the political guests on Joe Rogan's podcast are Jewish. What does this mean? You know, and and that's that's an important point. I always try to um, try to like hold myself to an important standard is like um, to not to not talk about the stuff because I think as soon as you do, 
Um, people have a tendency to, once they can label you today, once they can label you uh, a neon Yahtzee or whatever they're going to call you, like they feel sanctioned by society to shut you down. Like, right. And it's not, it's not only, only a neutral thing. Like it's something that's just immoral for them to do. Like they, they silenced a bad voice. So you know, it, it's just important to me to avoid like don't don't give them anything w with which they can label you with which they can you know decide to click off the video and and not get that information out there um so like so yeah i guess that's where like the, yeah the robert seffer stuff like i find him interesting personally um but uh yeah I, I just don't know if i could do something like that that's tough yeah yeah i wouldn't go like that far even myself i try to strike some kind of a balance yeah. But then there's the trade-off, like, in order to avoid being called a conspiracy theorist, do you just not talk about actual conspiracies? Because sort of, like, performatively, if you're afraid of being labeled this kind of demonized term, you're buying into the idea that there is some kind of agenda against that outlook, you know? So it's like, I feel, I feel like that's a tension, that I'd rather just suck it up and be called a conspiracy theorist and go ahead and like explore the ideas that I'm interested in. But I mean, you're not necessarily interested in the same kind of explicitly conspiracy theorist type ideas. Sounds like. Yeah, I guess not, not particularly like, again, if I can keep it all grounded in terms of like something that I feel it can accomplish an actual political goal, like that would, that's ideal for me. Um, well, let's go back like, to ethics. Um, and what do you think about, like, so we have these nations that are self-determined and we're seeking life, liberty, happiness. Um, I guess, what is kind of the end goal in that? Like, what are these societies aiming at? Or is, like, the good of society simply its continued existence and, the, like, micro goods that people are able to experience here? Do you Do you see some kind of, like end or ethical telos you know goal in life or um yeah i i don't know that there would be one besides just like uh, essentially have everyone live in you know perfect accordance with goodness or you know uh more religious would say like have everyone living in a perfect accordance with god um and I, I think that's like a sufficient end in, in and of itself. Um, I don't know if there has to be some sort of end goal to the species, end goal to to your group. Um, besides that, you know. So for the individual, then, do you think there's an end? Like, do you believe uh, in some kind of immortality for the soul, or is it just once it's over, it's over? Yeah. Um, it's tough because, like, in a sense, I can understand the. I, I I've kind of changed on this a little bit, where I I think of God more as like an actual personified being, whereas when I first started, sort of came to like my rough understanding of him, it was something more like, you know, just an abstract concept concept of goodness. So. Um, Oh, sorry. What was the question? I got a little bit. For, of well, relating to the end for the individual, do you think there's some kind of immortality to the soul, or do you believe in a soul, or like, you know? Oh, oh right, right. Um, what's the end game? So, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess what I was gonna say with that is like, um, if you think of God as just a more abstract concept of goodness that you can live in accordance with, then it makes it difficult to extend that into any thinking about. Uh, more strictly spiritual ideas I guess like how, how can you derive from like you can see that there are actions that are concretely good in this world and they lead to good and flourishing but it's all within this world um, I, I struggle to see how you can really as I get anything more out of that like like how, can, how you can prove that there is an afterlife or there is a, a life after life is like some sort of way that your spirit lives on besides in the abstract sense of like your descendants and things like that or um, your deeds on earth um, I think though it, it, if you do come to a more like 
I guess personified. I don't know if it's a Christian. Probably I'm probably influenced by Christian Christianity, but if you come to that concept of like a more personified God, you can then easily see how um, you can have faith in these ideas of an afterlife and all these things. But but I guess I still have like a a hard time determining if those are just like wishful thinking or not. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. That's such a hard barrier to cross. Like. How can you tell someone without just like invoking faith that like there is some sort of afterlife that's not an abstract concept of your deeds and your descendants living on, you know? Right. So the way that I got into uh, thinking about God initially was really just thinking about like kind of the limits of intelligence. Um, you know, obviously with AI, we're like contemplating the possibility of superhuman intelligence, maybe not immediately, but maybe one day. And I was thinking about that sort of thing like 10 years ago, like exactly how far could it be pushed? In physics, I like the many worlds interpretation. I think I could argue for that even against like actual physicists and and make a good case. And I've listened to a ton of different arguments relating to it. Um, But if that's true, then any possible branching, to, like any interaction, subatomic interaction leads to its own unique division of the multiverse, right? So if you're looking at probability estimates as to like how far can intelligence go, well, you're exhausting the entire search space. Like all of the possible intelligences are going to be actual if many worlds interpretation is true. So exact, like what are the limits on intelligence how far can this actually go and like even just with say we develop like a hyper sophisticated agi here that intelligence won't just come into being the moment that it actualizes as agi because it will have memories of everything that it has electronic access to which will include like details of our lives all of like the things that we've been inputting over the decades Mm -hmm. now like extrapolate that beyond just like the kind of agi that we could create and you wonder like is or or like with nick bostrom simulation argument you know the idea that um we could explain our experiences just as well by saying these are simulated experiences within some kind of hyper advanced computational system in like earth's future or somewhere in the multiverse right so if that was the case like there's a way in which i don't know like the the hyper mind at the end of time would have memories of all of our experiences that was the thought that kind of got me thinking like seriously about the possibility of immortality um and that's that's not precisely the argument but what do you think of of that kind of reasoning that like what is the ultimate trajectory of intelligence how far can it go if the universe is infinite you would almost just kind of want to say okay then intelligence is infinite or is there like a finite limit at some point for some fit maybe physical reason or i i wouldn't know about that i don't see any reason why you can't just become smarter and smarter without it without end but it, it doesn't seem to like I don't know if I'm relying too much on like the Christian idea of God, but I always thought it was something that existed outside of the universe and like beyond all space and time. And like, I think that's, I don't know. that's theologically correct. In my opinion, the, the idea yeah. that I was just talking about is kind of a springboard to get you like thinking about higher levels that are just scientifically plausible. Like how far can we push this here in the cosmos and then start right. thinking about, you know, what's maybe beyond just the physical Right. I, I just guess with this idea of like you have some super intelligence that's like somehow drawing on all possible experiences like at, you know, like at, at what point does that actually become the idea of the existing outside of the universe God? Like or cause it, like that still seems very much like physical, tangible, like it wouldn't totally mesh with the Christian idea of the God. But right. But in, in another sense, though, like if the limit, if there was no limit and intelligence is potentially unbounded universe is infinite it's infinite then like like just like you said it would have every possible experience in its catalog because like 
it, it's actually a theorem from um, you know computer science that like uh, Turing machines are universal. Like what's computable on one computer is computable on another computer. So the infinite computer, by definition, computes everything. So then like anything that we're processing, it's processing. And so you could say like if that's true then our experience is the individual experience we're having now, but it's also sort of a memory of the God mind in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking, I, I, I guess, yeah, like you have created a scenario in which there would be like an infinite intelligence, which is is certainly in line with the concept of God, but like, I don't know, I just can't fight that feeling that there's like a lack of making that leap to, to like the totally outside of the universe god but I, I guess is is it like sufficient to be called god to simply have infinite intelligence or like or i, I don't know is that even infinite intelligence i don't know it's <laughs> it's a tough question like i feel like i generally do better thinking about these things when i can like have a long time to think them out and like write down my thoughts mm -hmm. yeah i don't know yeah i just wanted to throw that like thought experiment out there um but i think you have the exact like right instinct you know in, in platonism interpreted through neoplatonism because that's kind of my school of thought that like the way that the neoplatonists in general interpret plato is faithful to plato it wasn't like a deviation or something um and of course they have differences of opinion i kind of fall on like proclus was basically right on most things for the most part and uh so but they have this view that like there's the third hypostasis where souls are and there would be the chief soul there's also the idea that the highest member of a particular series of beings contains all the powers of all the lower members of the series just like you know the infinite computer can compute everything that all finite computers can compute so the first among souls the world soul will kind of subsume and have access to everything that every other soul can do but it's not like the own that's not the top level because the world soul is still a kind of temporal uh entity for the platonists that wouldn't be within the physical universe because platonists don't say that like consciousness here supervenes on physical matter they would say that the opposite physical matter supervenes on consciousness um kind of a basic idealism but uh beyond uh, soul of course there's the realm of forms the second hypostasis and there you get into concepts that are closer to the idea of god in christianity um kind of the lowest aspect according to neoplatonists of the second hypostasis is the demiurge so there are higher levels of the forms that are more like purely upwardly oriented and like kind of containing all goodness and beauty and truth in themselves but then at the bottom of that realm there's this kind of mediating figure that himself is outside of time but like sees the need sees the goodness in generating the the th uh, third hypostasis and everything that can flow from that so like in platonism that's where i found they they go as far as i had gone despite lacking modern physics, but then they like make this transcend transcendental or transcendent like leap and contemplate like what, what realms of things could exist beyond the physical. So I guess on that, you already have this intuition. What do you think about like mathematical objects? What do you think about uh, the forms in general? Like, would you say you're a platonic realist on those things um have you thought much about like these different possible ontological levels i i suppose i have like a sort of brief introduction to that from reading plato but i've, I've never specifically studied i guess like the neoplatonists um yeah I, I mean i guess like my the primary way in which i understand like these beings at a at a different level are like through concepts through goodness and truth and beauty like i understand that these are um you know in a sense they're uh, immortal beings like like i don't know i see like a lot of times um i've read just like out of curiosity like a lot of old pagan stuff um I don't know, like the, the norse things uh, the sagas and um 
and uh, poetic eight is and whatever or the eight is. Um, and I, I always kind of understood the ways that that they understood their gods as like I, I, I mean kind of kind of like what you were saying like they um, they obviously understand beauty through whatever beauty god through Aphrodite or whatever. Um, they understand uh, courage through Thor or whoever it happens to be. And these immortal concepts that they recognized were it just, just personified in order to, I, I think, facilitate telling stories. It's mm-hmm. obviously much better to tell a story about a person who personifies this, this trait rather than give some theological yeah. dissertation about, about the nature of beauty. It's or a genius, I mean, absolutely genius mnemonic device for explaining metaphysics. Like imagine if instead of the way that they teach physics in school with equations and diagrams, they personified the different physical forces in like characters that adequately captured like this element of electricity or gravity and then told stories like about the creation of the universe. Like people would remember that stuff. And then once you related it back to the physics, like they would remember the physics. Yeah. And I think like uh, even within the, it depends what time period you're sort of looking at, but even within those people who were, uh, you know, pantheistic or, or multi-theistic, what, what, what's the word I'm thinking of? They had multiple gods. Yeah. Polytheism. Um, even within those, like, I think it was sort of like in later developments in, in, in Greek polytheism, they sort of started to subsume all of these things and say that, yeah, Aphrodite exists. However, she is ultimately an aspect of Zeus who is, you know, the figurehead and like the, the motivating force. Like, so I, I, that, that's kind of interesting, interesting concept. Like, I don't know. I talk about this with my, uh, my friend who's very Christian. Um, I, I, I've kind of tried to like talk about some of the pagan stuff I'm reading and he just denounces it all as heresy because, you know, he's super fundamentalist or whatever. But um, like, I, I almost, I almost don't see it as like uh contradicting at all and like maybe you do as a christian no, but like absolutely not I don't, yeah i don't see the the pagan stuff like it's not to be little or to detract from the the ultimate good in order to uh, to to talk about an aspect of it in like a an individualized focused way rather it's just like another way to understand it and glorify it in a way right so like yeah yeah that's I don't know, like... it makes me think like it's kind of unfortunate that like a lot of the pagan movements today, like neo-pagan movements, um, from what I know about them, there doesn't seem to be a lot there. Like, there's not a, a whole lot of developed theology. But, like, there are some basic, like, core tenets and things I think you can extract, even from, like, the old the old sagas and um, uh, religious writings. Like, I mean, the Iliad is, I think, probably the best book ever written. And um, there's just, I mean, there's a lot of, like, useful things that you can extract from those. And, like, I... I it seems obvious to me, um, and I think it's pretty well established that the Greeks had had heavy influence on uh, the early church fathers. Like, mm-hmm. there's so much in, in common between the Greek thought and Christianity. So, um, yeah, it's yeah, a shame. It's like, sort of... the Christians could have been far more conciliatory to the pagan Platonists, but instead they persecuted them. You know, like d- stole their institutions. Uh, literally stole their theological work in the case of Proclus, like pseudo Dionysius, very obviously stole whole arguments from Proclus, and and yet like denounce what the pagans were doing as demon worship, when you know they were offered plenty of outs and like a, a more peaceful way of of reconciling the worldviews. Olympiodorus was one of the last teachers in the Platonic school. It was actually. Um, or like a general philosophical school um, included Aristotle and, and Plato and everything. But he was one of the last pagan instructors there. And he told his uh, mostly Christian students, like, when Plato talks about the gods, it's okay just to interpret that as multiple aspects of the one God. Because in Platonism, we have this idea that at the summit of everything, there is the one and the good. And that contains, in some sense, everything else, and yet it manifests in different emanations appropriate to different purposes. Um, and even within like Jewish 
uh, like Abrahamic mythology, you can see that with the figures of the angels. In fact, some of the church fathers interpret explicit references to angels or messengers in the Old Testament as theophanies, as appearances of the sun. Um, and so therefore they do believe that this one God has multiple aspects and multiple manners of, of self-revelation. Um, so like, yeah, I, I figure that's a perfectly fair way to interpret pagan gods. And so when like the German tribes encounter Christianity and some of them were like, okay, yeah, we can, uh, we'll worship Jesus, Jesus as well. So we'll like worship Thor and Odin and Jesus and it'll, it'll all be good. I kind of agree with that kind of perspective. Um, for, for my part, though, I do say that like you, you do have to include Jesus as one of these these members, primarily for the moral innovation that you do get from Jesus. And I think there are good arguments for the necessity of accepting that kind of reciprocal forgiveness, which people like just from a world heritage standpoint, I think should credit to that historical figure, Jesus, because it's not really in any previous literary tradition that I can recognize the idea that if you forgive others, you will be forgiven. Like that's a very mm -hmm. radical thing. Um, so I think that right. itself just as a doctrine, like warrants his inclusion in the Pantheon. But is, is that specifically like a, a, a personal forgiveness only? Cause you know, I remember, you know, the famous story of David, um, where, where he essentially cucked that guy and sent him off to war so mm. he could have sex with the wife. <laughs> um, you know, but the point of that story was obviously that he, you know, even though, like, he, he truly recognized the wrong that he had done, and then he was forgiven. So, I don't know, could that be just said to be an older Jewish idea? Uh, no, I think, yeah, repentance and forgiveness has a wider scope and like love of your enemy even is there like Socrates has that attitude. I mean, he argues in the Gorgias that, yeah, he would rather suffer injustice than commit injustice. And so if someone's going to try to harm him, like his, his line is basically that like the truly wise man um, cannot be harmed physically by the bad man, the bad, the, excuse me, the bad man can't harm the good man because what is good in the good man is kind of immune to that kind of physical suffering because um, he seeks his, his satisfaction from elsewhere but so a lot of this stuff is definitely present um, in different sources but I think that like kind of karmic law of reciprocal forgiveness is unique to Jesus um, at one point in at the Fadana Center in Hollywood, um, someone asked in a question and answer session, like, is there any way to be forgiven for your past sins? Or do you just have to work out your karma through, you know, karma yoga or different forms of penance and, you know, things like that, sacrifices, I don't know. Um, and the answer for the teacher was just like, nope, you have to work it out. There's nothing you can do about it. It's part of the natural law. Um, but I think it does make sense. Like if you do good, good is done to you. You do bad, bad is done to you. If you forgive, then you can be forgiven. Like, I don't see why that logic shouldn't also hold. Um, also the idea of like a covenantal relationship with someone who can administer that kind of karmic exception also I think makes a lot of sense because that is kind of how it works. Like if you, vow to obey your parents, then your parents will take care of your basic needs. Even though you're not capable of fending for yourself, you form a covenant with someone who is more capable than yourself and they look out for you. Or you're like, you're a wife to a husband, you form a covenant and you're cared for in a certain way. Well, why could you not form a covenant with some kind of pan-dimensional hyper-intelligence? You know, it seems like, why not? Um, yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. What what do you, what are your thoughts if we're talking about Christianity? What are your thoughts on like, I guess sort of like the political implications of Christianity? Like, I, don't know, I guess I guess like put it simply, like should we have a, a state-sanctioned religion or at least like a state-recommended religion? Like I guess you could say the Church of England is. 
you know mm. is, is should we should we force christianity on people because like i'm certainly up to sacrifice my sunday mornings if uh if it means a return of uh you know the 1950s or something you know something <laughs> akin to that yeah yeah uh a lot of people have that attitude um i don't think that it should be coercively enforced on anyone um yeah i mean i, I do think like a religiously backed monarchy like the english system is sort of the way to go um and not necessarily for all of america i mean personally i'm not like a diehard american patriot you know i don't really have the opinion that there was like a unified american identity until quite late like even after the revolution regional distinctions and differences and religious differences weighed mm -hmm. a lot more heavily and, and to this day like there are places like where i am in southern missouri i don't get the sense that these people are like patriotic for america they're like patriots for the surrounding 100 square miles or something um sure, sure. so anyway i think yeah like a christian nationalist breakaway would probably be a very powerful force long run if that ever happened um, and I would endorse that kind of thing, but it's, right. it's tricky. Cause there could be a whole range of like, uh, like how far do they enforce their Christianity? I would rather live in a more like enlightened Anglican style, religious, uh, despot uh, despotism, but also you could see like a hardcore inquisition, you know, like if, if Nick Fuentes was the, um, king of, uh, the Catholic Imperium in, in, north america right i don't know if i would want to live under it i mean i i want to see it to be honest it would just be interesting yeah. but it, it almost seems like it's like like we kind of we're talking about before it's it's more of like a cultural issue before anything else because like i i mean the uk is still nominally uh they promote the the church of england but like how, how much social impact is that really having these days on uh on their society maybe more than you would think i mean religious attendance is down but there are some really uh outstanding intellectuals out of anglicanism um like rupert sheldrake is an anglican this guy i talked to a while ago paul tyson is an anglican he's out of australia but still they have the same kind of basic state religion being part of the commonwealth um mm -hmm. to an extent I think it's hard to evaluate, uh, like the, the eternal Anglo has like wily ways and always has. So it's, it's really difficult to see like what their game plan is with the way that Anglicanism has developed. I don't appreciate like endorsing the LGBT stuff, but also like it's, it's clearly, I, I would say it's very obviously like a weaponized form of religion and I think the cart is leading the horse in that sense, in that particular case. But also, like I said, I, I wouldn't discount what they're doing because maybe, you know, there's some 3D or 4D chess going on uh, that we're not seeing with it. But uh, Maybe. I, it, it's hard not to get the, the feeling that it's just they're kind of... It, it, I guess in terms of, like, the cultural issues that I'm concerned about, the mass immigration, and yeah. just for... A, the prime example it, it seems like they're not really doing much in, in that regard like if there was some sort of you know theocratic uh, catholic fascist whatever takeover mm -hmm. uh, it, that would come because people wanted it and they wanted that cultural change and you know they, they're just putting it under this flaghead uh, of christianity or whatever whatever form of christianity they want but like ultimately it has to be willed by by culture by society so like mm -hmm. i don't know it's almost like it, it, it almost just like doesn't matter. Like, do we I implement a Catholic fascist society? Like, well, first you'd have to get the political, the political willpower in order to do something like that. And then not in, not in every way. And there would be definite differences, but like, it, it just feels like the religion aspect would be window dressing. So like, I don't know. I get, I get a sense of futility from trying to do some sort of state religion like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean by, like, the cart leading the horse there. And right. I think Catholicism also has been, in my opinion, despite being a practicing Catholic, I'm not, like, a Catholic in my views, which is why recently I've 
you know, stopped like taking communion, which, so I'm not violating any religious laws within Catholicism now. In the past I was, cause it, I didn't really understand that I shouldn't be like, I, I had all the sacraments. I, you know, was in good standing with the church or whatnot, but I do have like serious dogmatic, uh, differences. So according to them, I'm a heretic. I'll, you know, respect their, their views and not take communion, but notwithstanding, I do think Catholicism has been like a political tool from from the earliest days like the very earliest days and the way the early church worked the way that it acquired power in rome that's also another interesting video topic potentially like the rise of the church and how did mm -hmm. how did christianity conquer rome a lot of people have looked at it but i feel like there's just uh and maybe it's we lack certain tangible evidence about it but i feel like there's a deeper story to be told there um but what i have in mind is more like a genuine Christian nationalism where like religious fervor creates a new nation. And the only example there really to look to is the Mormons. Like the Mormons were kind of what I'm talking about there and they've stayed true to the faith. And I don't know about um, statistics in Utah relating to depression, anxiety, suicide, drug use and whatnot. It would be interesting to see that, you know, mm -hmm. cause it's still, it, it is probably the most religious state, right? I would think so. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah, I would imagine, because yeah. it's such a huge percentage Mormon. Yeah. Um, I always liked Mormons that I knew growing up in California. Um, yeah, I just thought they were a little odd, but very nice. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Everyone's a little odd in their own way, I think. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, I think there's like there's a tendency in history for events to be foreshadowed like a, a small wave will come and then like the actual tsunami will come and i'm i wonder like is there a potential that mormonism was that like minor wave before the tsunami of a genuine christian uh christian nationalism like leading the way into like in spangler's model for example like people say that America is right around the phase where Rome was going from Republic to empire. So becoming the empire meant commissioning, uh, Virgil to write the Aeneid and, and all this like pomp and circumstance, um, entering around the, the cult of the, the emperor. So, so something like that, it just seems like it would line up and might be like a viable, path forward if it was done correctly you know if there was some genuine like you would really need a, a new kind of christianity i think to to have that energy because typically when a new religion forms there is that fervor and as it ages it wanes right. so that's one possibility but um i guess what do you think also because like i think you know about my project down here to start a school and um also start like other communities in the area and try to network them together there's a uh, balaji's book the network state um which kind of outlines this as a, a different kind of third position um between like the chinese uh, strategy and american strategy in 21st century politics like the idea of just kind of going your own way and creating this new kind of patchwork state based on like ideological affiliation or religion mm -hmm. or whatnot. Cause we have a lot of networking technologies now that, you know, we just haven't really fully explored. So what do you think about just leaving the Christian nationalism aside? What do you think about that possibility of like the network state option? People have called a similar thing like the Benedict option or a fifth political theory. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a brilliant idea. Like, I suppose there'd be two main benefits. You know, the one is in that worst case scenario of like total collapse, you have that society that you can all lean on. But uh, in the now and the much more tangible, the benefit is just like, you know, people getting together is essentially like a force multiplier and you can, you can have more people moving in the same direction. I think that's like the main benefit you can sort of derive from it. And they're much more, you know, linked on a human level. They're, growing the same food for each other and living in the same areas. And like, I, I think that like, will just strengthen the bond to, to a much stronger degree than, you know, than all these people who are just talking around online, um, right. Getting into 
internet spats with each other. I, I can't stand when I see people in like right wing sort of different venues online, like trying to start e drama with each other. It's like, I don't know, as I, as I understood it, we were trying to like actually accomplish something politically, <laughs> but um, right, you know. But anyways, yeah, no, like I, I really, um, yeah, like I respect a lot what you're doing with that that movement, and I think those are sort of the two main benefits. I, I, I don't know if you think there's like a third or or anything else. Obviously, you've done a lot more thinking about it than me. Yeah, I mean, there's just tangible economic benefits. Like one of my main motivations to pursue that kind of strategy is just let's live cheaper you know let's live with better food at a lower cost let's uh mm-hmm. find ways of starting new businesses with lower startup capital and and just like i you know grew, i grew up in southern california and i noticed that okay when illegal immigrants come in and put 20 family members in a house and then form their own businesses like they rise up fairly quickly you know, it, there right. is a possibility for social mobility if you collectivize, and it's just right. we're not. Right. Despite Acidic being, yeah, well, yeah, probably be a good example. Right. Yeah. They have their own police force <laughs> that help each other out. Really? Like literally, if, yeah. If someone's in robbed in New York City, yeah, huh. you can call. Uh, if you're a Hasidic Jew, they have um, a special number, a hotline that they have set up. And I mean, they live in such small, small areas. You can get someone in there with like a minute Hmm. and um, they're all trained on how to make citizens arrests. It's kind of wild. But I mean, frankly, like that's if that's the way the country is going, that like they're, you know, inviting in all these people that are going to make these fractionalized communities and the mainstream society is is no longer something that we can identify with the mainstream culture, then, yeah, it only makes sense to like reap those benefits that other people are essentially getting um at our expense yeah of course and it's also just bothered me like over the years online we are in principle collectivists but then by demonstrated preference we're absolute individualists like just literally like the people in right-wing circles arguing for the this kind of collective identity identitarian politics are some of like the most loner types that exist in our society um you got to be a little bit in order to especially if you're open with your ideas uh, it it tends to make you uh you know i I don't want to overstate it like it's not some like horrible thing like i i certainly have maintained relationships with uh friends and family it's not a big thing but like generally people who are willing to hold those ideas that go against societal norms they're gonna tend to be loners you know right yeah i mean it it makes sense but there is that tension where outwardly we're collectivist but in our personal lives we're individualist outwardly we affirm hierarchy but then like we don't have coherent hierarchical structures you know right there are a few organizations that try to do that um but I think the wider like ecosystem, maybe over the years we've gotten more that way, where like there is a kind of perceived rank that eventually develops, where like people will give respect to a handful of people who like okay yeah we're trusting these people with the message, you know mm-hmm. I think honestly Nick Fuentes and his cult of personality and like pushing for that has been a big factor in changing attitudes. Um, right. I Gustav Le Bon is a sociologist from the early 20th century. He wrote a book, The Crowd, where he talks about these kind of psychological di- uh, dynamics that, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if Hitler himself read The Crowd, but it was like obviously influential in the kind of approach to uh, demagoguery and populism that w- was taken in the 20s and 30s. Um, but yeah he says that you need like an intensely narcissistic figure as the leader so that it's easy for other people to invent in rather invest their sense of self in him because he is so self-obsessed it's almost like your ego is like you know he feeds off of your ego at some level and like absorbs your ego and then you invest in him and that unites everyone because everyone like mm-hmm. sacrifices some part of their own identity into this one figure that's the extreme and that's like the personal charismatic type of hierarchy um 
I think though there's like that middle ground where so on the extremes we have like egalitarian sentiments where people are disrespectful and like just too fractious to form coherent hierarchies even still that people are on that end of the spectrum in these circles and then you have the we need our king cult of personality like unquestioning trust the plan kind of people hierarchy but in between mm -hmm. that i feel like we haven't properly developed that space where like let's just form rational meritocratic hierarchies you know and it's just not as like exciting i guess to get that started like all right guys mm -hmm. let's start an llc that's not as romantic as all right we're gonna you know wage christian jihad you know yeah, yeah. i don't know I, I think maybe these days I'm tending. I mean, I come from like sort of like, you know, and I'm in high school, sort of a libertarian background, which I, I think a lot of people tend to tend to come from. Everyone had their libertarian stint and they still hold some libertarian sentiment sentiments to some point. But I, I'm falling more and more into the uh, and, and maybe it'll make me jump at, a, at the opportunity too quickly. But, you know, it would be nice to find our guy and, uh, <laughs> and support him. Yeah, no, pragmatically, it has a lot of advantages. I mean, monarchies, you know, this is like a point that um, Hoppe, Hans Hermann Hoppe makes from like the libertarian perspective that like monarchies naturally form in corporations. You need like one responsible party where in a crisis scenario or just some important decision needs to be made, somebody gets to make that call. Whereas if you try to create like the perfect meritocratic system with checks and balances, well, like at the end of the day, when a decision needs to be made, you can't have a bunch of intellectuals engaging in hours of debate because then right. your organization is just slower. And then the, the organization with the charismatic head, maybe that guy it is not like quite as intelligent as this group of intellectuals but he acts immediately and he takes 10 moves for every one move that the bureaucracy makes right so yeah it's there's something it, it opens up, opens you up to the possibility of making a catastrophic mistake with the one man <laughs> acting whereas the group would tend towards the average of all their intelligences so you're going to get a much more consistent although slower and um you know ultimately like if you look at like governments you're going to get a lot of like not hyper intelligent people i'm not saying anyone in government is dumb uh, generally speaking people in positions of power are actually very intelligent but you know you're, you don't have the opportunity to get this like one super freak intelligence or this one person who's like uh, perfectly suited to make decisions in, in this case so i think it, with these like mass democracies or like these councils or whatever it is where you have a lot of people involved in making decisions just the quality of their their decisions is going to tend towards the average so like that's right that's actually like kind of the benefit though mm -hmm. uh, of having those democracies is like for most of the time you probably want that form of government but it's just like and this is kind of like the point i i advocate with like the dictatorship things like it would it would be beneficial if we had a Roman Republican style dictator who we could, when needed, put into office in order to make snap decisions. Right. Uh, when we come to times of crisis and like, right, you only do it at times when you really, really need it because you could get a despot, you could get something mm -hmm. uh, which is going to harm you a lot more. But like, yeah, I, I don't know. You, you basically just have to like make that that calculation yourself as to like have things gotten bad enough and like i i for one thing right now like they, they certainly have and i could i could stand the risk of you know putting an autocrat into office yeah the problem is like no one's really a candidate we just don't have anyone that no. lives up to that um no, no i do agree guy. with plato I, it comes it'll be obvious i feel like yeah yeah yeah. when that person shows up it is obvious um yeah. when it happens organically but plato had the foresight to think about how to kind of cultivate that ideal philosopher king who does have like absolute authority in a certain sense it is even above the law in a certain sense um kind of like schmidian concepts of sovereignty come to mind and i think uh 
Plato's philosophy is obviously entirely consistent with some of that uh, early 20th century political thought um, that we still haven't really tapped. Like in some ways we have where I personally think like our, the economic systems, political systems uh, around the world have adopted a lot of those kind of experimental moves um, in Europe in the early 20th century, but they're, but we've like neutered it. We uh, absorbed some of their economic system, but then like also ours is like really serving a handful of billionaires in the way that there's, they made, they took steps not to do that. Um, or, you know, with regard to like the, the kind of social policy, um, we don't have to go into like all the details there, but people have said that like the structure of the EU is very similar to what uh, Nazi Germany had planned in the case of their victory for like how to lead Europe. So it seems like, you know, they, they did, I mean, they made a lot of progress in technology too. And we took what they, we took their literal scientists and put them to work for us, you know, to get us to the moon. So obviously we took a huge amount from them. Um, but there's, there's still a lot, um, in what they were doing that, and you don't have to like approve of the way they handled things, but yeah, uh, that being said, Plato is like, he covers a lot of bases, um, which is interesting that these things that seem like very different historical moments, like they're, they're not necessarily as, as divided. And, you know, Plato has the idea that whenever the ideal state comes back, it's always going to have certain features in common. And like, this is a, a recurring archetype, the ideal state. And it does kind of look like fascism, you know, at a certain level. Um, right. Not that I'm a fascist. Uh, I would just say I'm a Platonist and leave it at that. It's probably safer. Um, but cool. Yeah. So um, what do you think about AI? Like, as someone who uses computers? Um, um, I think it's a fantastic tool. I've been using it a lot recently, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been using it uh, actually in my like kind of daily personal projects um there's you know uh, things that have been integrated into like development environments that kind of help you code and it's just a cool way to speed things up but even um I i'm working on a project right now which is essentially a um it it's like a large database project and it it's basically just meant to like fully extend those videos i was working on with that deal with the uh, media representation oh yeah i heard you um, talk about that with um the uh yeah endeavor endeavor yeah 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 so um yeah i mean literally n not at this moment actually i just i reset my computer but um normally as i i work from home normally as i'm working from home i just have uh an ai slave in a way uh <laughs> tallying lists and um essentially scraping scraping the internet for like a bunch of data on like certain people from uh a whole variety of different like uh, groups of people you know so uh i don't know uh that kind of only deals of course with like the actual tangible uh side of ai right now uh so <laughs> in that regard i think it's awesome um but yeah in terms of like like what it portends um i don't know that it's like immediately gonna like uh you know overhaul society you know i i frankly don't think we're gonna like all of a sudden have all these programmers out of a job uh, i think more realistically what's gonna happen is like w when it does happen even because it'll take you know 10 20 years for these these people to actually like adopt ai systems uh, like the big companies silicon valley and everything they'll they'll adopt these things a lot more quickly but um you know really what it, what it's gonna be like is more like what you're seeing with like proposed in like the trucking industry where they they want one trucker to be steering essentially a whole convoy of uh automated automated trucks behind them hmm. i think you're gonna have like one single developer who is just enhanced by ai right um ultimately instead he's... of leading a team of indians it'll just be leading a team of ais <laughs> yeah i know like exactly 100 percent. you're gonna say i need a web page i need a welcome page that will let the user log in, do this, this, and this, and then it'll just be a matter of using plain language to describe if there's something wrong with it, you know, make a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll still have to have the technical know-how because um, 
as of right now, at least, and like maybe this could get better. I don't. I don't really see very clearly what's on the horizon, but I feel like as of right now, AI doesn't have like great decision making. It's just, I don't know. It's very. It it feels like a computer. It feels like I can't think. Um, more abstractly, it can't work towards a goal, and it can't manage. Uh, the, like a lot of complex systems and like it, it has a hard time tying them all together i think that's going to be at least in like the medium sort of term um for a human to do to like yeah to manage it essentially um right. in the future I, I think all bets are off i think <laughs> yeah it could become super intelligent and the need for uh you know programming jobs for instance or but but just like anything dealing with like intelligence fields is uh the need for people to do that it's like it's it's definitely going to wane significantly and right. what that entails um i don't know that's that's when we start speculating even at the tangible level i think we really have crossed a threshold where things will immediately change i think it's it's really equivalent to like you know someone just developed uh the rifle for the first time you know and people have been using crossbows and uh castles and whatnot like i think we're at that level where yeah it, it took some time to have it universally implemented but whoever implemented it first they're the ones who survived you know i think that's really what it's going to look like i think even for like youtubers for people who are making content if you find the right ways of using ai you can just produce a lot more than other people and also like a lot of what makes good good content is an ability to edit. So if you can use AI to create rough drafts and let go of your hubris about like, no, it needs to be written by a human, you can touch it up and make it look exactly like it was written by a human. It's just bringing a lot of facts to the table scoured from the entire internet that you wouldn't necessarily have been able to come up with on your own immediately. And so I think like, yeah, um, artists who are using AI will be more successful, um, music producers, like anyone who is in creative work will benefit and already is benefiting from AI. And if you don't adopt it, that's gonna be a huge detriment. I think it's gonna be like already before the whole um, large language model kind of paradigm got kicked off, people, corporations were using AI workflow optimization like um, UPS was one of the first corporations to really implement it thoroughly like tracking all the metrics that's why like if you're a ups driver like every single second of your day is accounted for and they know exactly when to promote you when to fire you based on a kind of algorithmic system um but they have uh kind of outsourced that or that's not the right word they've um been consultants for other corporations implementing that kind of workflow optimization like walmart has done obviously similar things i think most of the big corporations are going to have to adopt this new generation of ai technologies even in like in um management in uh like yeah higher level corporate decision making um like i just experimented with an ai in one of my groups uh that listens to a meeting and we'll give you a summary of the meeting and you can ask it questions right. about the things that were talked about in the meeting. Now, it already, and there was a, a space that I had on Twitter a little while ago um, about like conflict resolution. And I just thought like, why not? I'm gonna go on ChatGPT and look like, okay, what are like some of the best tips for conflict resolution? So I read that whole list and that gave me stuff to say for my space. So hmm. what is that gonna look like when meetings are fully, like in a corporate setting, fully recorded by, by AI and AI has this massive knowledge base of best practices in a corporate environment? Like, do you need consultants anymore coming in and telling you how to run things? Or do you just have, at what point then is the AI de facto just in charge, you know, right. being this kind of consultant? Yeah, it's like only our discomfort that would really stop it from, uh, or delay it from getting into those positions. Yeah. I, think I don't know, man. People who it's, do it uh, are going to have an advantage. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree, I guess. It's, um, it's scary. I don't know. Your mind just goes immediately to the, uh, you know, human, uh, human replacement sort of conspiracy theories or, uh, 
I guess, yeah. I guess at the very least, like, UBI sort of impl implementations. Right. You know? And, like, I wish it was just a conspiracy. I wish that this was, like, planned and it's about centralized control and automate automation or whatnot. I don't think anybody's controlling this. I'm generally a conspiracy theorist, but when it comes to, like, AI explosion, I think it's out of anybody's hands and there is no putting the genie back in the bottle. Personally, like, I think the only way to come out of this without human extinction is to build the benevolent philosopher king AI and have that dominate everything. Hmm. I don't know what you think about that, but because... Um, yeah. I suppose if it was implemented in like an open way where we could see the code, I'd, I'd be more inclined to uh, agree to something like that. You know, assuming it gets, you know, another however much, however many years of development it needs to like <laughs> convince me that it's sufficiently intelligent or sufficiently rational at least uh, to be able to be trusted with these decisions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... I don't see any reason, but you know, at the same time, like, I don't know. I think people sort of, people would still definitely oppose it. Just, you know, if they got a whiff of like, you know, some sense that this was like autocratic or, or some way that it was overriding right. the will of the people. Like, I, I don't think even, even if you had, in theory, you could develop something that was like godlike in its intelligence and perfect in its, its decision-making. I don't think people would ever, you know, people just have like a very strong revulsion, a very strong instinct to just not trust anything that they can label autocratic or, or dictatorial right. or, or, or whatever. So like, I, I think people would still feel like they need to deny this thing. Um, what would happen uh, that, though? There'd, like, there'd be a big hurdle in the, in the way. What would happen if Nicaragua or, or some country went ahead and like implemented the AI dictatorship and then their society just constantly improved and was hyper efficient and the economy skyrocketed, quality of life went up, people in the country are saying how great it is. Right. Then, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, like the rational, if someone was rational, they, in theory, they never should, no one should ever deny, like, like if you could have God as your dictator, it's obviously completely irrational to say like, no, I don't want this because, you know, autocracy is just, a priori bad and i refuse to to debate it um yeah I was, I was just saying people will think that way but uh i don't know i i suppose in insofar as like you know geopolitics is like a competition between people like they would eventually necessarily come to dominate you know i, I guess it would just be a race to the bottom or or what i don't know yeah uh people look at this i think the wrong way with like yeah ai has limitations but when intelligently implemented, there are always, it's only an extra tool. Using AI, there's never a case really, unless you're like foolishly relying on it. Like there was that story of the lawyer who was using AI to argue cases and the AI was coming yeah. up with fake yeah. cases. So you got in trouble. Yeah. But like, if you're using it intelligently, it's only gonna boost your ability. So the only, just game theoretic dynamic suggests the people who find more ways to use this new processing power creatively will be the ones who ascend. And like whatever new tactics someone adopts, all the other firms, all the other countries adopt it until like what's the logical conclusion of that process. It's either AI runaway, you know, like self-replicating paperclip factory scenario or whatever it is, or we get the good AI where it, you know, it's worth everyone adopting it. Right. I don't see any other yeah, way out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the only other way is if there is some definite distinction between between human intelligence and AI intelligence, that it, there's something unique about us. In which case, I suppose, you know, the best thing to do would just be to use AI like we're being we're using it now and just, you know, work alongside it. Right. But, but yeah, but I guess even in that case, ultimately kind of ends up the same. But then Neuralink, like, yeah, you'll you'll just have like Elon Musk be the incarnate yeah. AI God King at a certain point. Hey, I'm for it, man. If that's <laughs> what it's gotta be. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. There are less interesting futures at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, this has been fun. Uh, I think we all learned a little bit more about, you know, your kind of general worldview and, um, 
yeah, this was great. I recommend Alex's channel for everyone. I'm sure uh, all of you guys have seen it already, but um, very high quality videos. I hope you keep up what you've been doing. Any last thoughts or like, you know, anything you want to show for the audience? Um, yeah, nothing in particular, man. I, I don't really do anything besides put out YouTube videos. So yeah, check me out there. I'd appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Absolutely. It was fun. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Take care.